So I wanted to uh, widen the discussion. Just, I just wanted you to note that all the data that you saw previously were based on radiological evaluation of treatment. So it is definitely a good question. Are we doing right when we're uh, evaluating our tumors? So um, what do we have right now? What's our only tool is RESIST. I'm not going to go over all this. Um, but basically, we have different types of lesions. And in RESIST, you define response as a decrease of 30% of the size of lesions. And progression is either an increase of 20%, an increase in non-target lesions, or new lesions. But what you have to know about RESIST is that these thresholds are totally arbitrary. They were chosen only for clinical trials to be able to compare trials uh, between them, not for everyday clinical use. So basically, um, these thresholds, are, or this technique, is just used to describe what happens to tumors. And it was not intended to infer a meaningful benefit. And that's the most important thing that you have to remember when you start using RESIST in a clinical setting. So I'm still going to start talking, before progression, I'm going to talk a little about response because I think it's important. Um, and we've been working on this uh, with the team of Stéphane Oudard uh, um, uh, for a long time, for almost 10 years. Can we find a criteria of response which reflects a benefit? Because that's what you want as an oncologist. So we've worked on several things, criteria of size, necrosis, perfusion. I'm just going to tell you about our work on size. Um, we've published a paper about using a minus 10% threshold to differentiate patients who benefited uh, from these uh, treatments. And this was a very effective threshold since the responder patients um, had an 11 month PFS, whereas the non-responders had a five month PFS. And there have since then been several publications on independent populations that have shown that this threshold does really reflect differences in PFS, and therefore, we hope, differences in clinical benefit. But the interesting thing I want to show you is this other uh, paper on Everlimus, um, where you see that there are responders here. Um, there's a difference in PFS between responders and non-responders. But the interesting data that came out of that study was that there was also a benefit for non between non-responders and placebo. So what does that mean? I'm just going to uh, summarize what that means in, in terms of size. We believe that this minus 10% threshold is a good threshold to differentiate patients that have a clinical benefit, but even relative non-responders have a better outcome than placebo. So basically, what does that mean? Whatever the radi radiologists tell you, patients are benefiting from treatment. So I guess that means that you don't really need to look, <laughs> to look radiologically if uh, your treatment is working. So I'm going to summarize this as, finally, a clinical benefit is not a response. It's an absence of progression. And then we get to our question, what is progression? What we have been seeing is that there are definitely different patient profiles. These patients, this first profile, are primary refractory patients. These are the easy ones. Basically, a treatment doesn't work at all. Here's an example of a patient who had pleural, lung lesions, liver lesions, and after a single cycle, you see that everything progresses in a very obvious way. These are easy. Change your therapy. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to argue about that one. These are the harder ones, patients that start by responding and that suddenly start progressing. As long as they're progressing rapidly, this slope goes up fast, I guess they're probably easy as well, because you're probably also going to be seeing this clinically. So I'll show you an example of a temporary response. Here's a lymph node that's between the aorta and the vena cava. After, this is before treatment. After a certain number of cycles, you see that this lymph node has decreased in size. And after a new number of cycles, you see that it's increasing again. So you see that the treatment worked, and it's not working so well anymore. That's a, a secondary progression. Note that if you don't have all these uh, different CT scans when the radiologist is reading them, that if you only have the first one and the last one, you might conclude that the patient is still responding. Now, these are the really hard ones, the slow progressors. And I'm sure you all have these patients that slowly uh, increase in tumor size. And the question is, when do you decide that that progression is significant? Here's an example um, of a patient who had this um, lung lesion that was chosen as a target lesion, several other lung lesions. I'm just showing you every two cycles. Progressively, you see that there are a little more lung lesions. This is cycle two. You compare cycle two, cycle four, there might be a little more of this unequivocal progression. 
cycle four, cycle six. But if you look back between this baseline and this this sixth cycle, and that's 18 months later, there is an obvious progression. The problem is this progression was so slow that radiologists didn't necessarily detect it. And then, as I was saying, when do you decide that it's too much? Just as a remark, you'll note that according to RESIST, these three categories of patients are considered non-responders, whereas they're obviously not the same patients at all. But the question we have to answer now, or are, is, are these the same patients? So now I'm going to ask the questions, and I'm sorry I don't have many answers. Are all progressors the same patients? And that's an important question because you might want to decide where your limit in progression, where your threshold in progression is, according to the answer to this question. So the question, I'm, I'm separating this in two things. Is there a difference between a patient that has been and a never was? And by that I mean, is there a difference between a patient that initially responded or one that never really responded and that's progressing slowly? And the second question, is the speed of progression important? Now, some people have been starting to work on that. And there was a publication from the Institut Curie in Paris that worked on tumor growth kinetics. And basically what they did was measure the kinetics before treatment and compare them to the kinetics after treatment. And in their case, in 44 patients, almost half of them had a decrease in tumor growth speed under treatment. The problem is, right now, we don't know uh, what, if, if that does reflect treatment benefit. And if it does, what would be the threshold of tumor growth in inhibition. Here are more questions. What is the optimal definition of progression? Is it a percent increase, an absolute increase? When does this increase translate into patient morbidity or mortality? Does it depend on the initial tumor burden? If you're using a percent increase and you have a small volume of disease, it's probably less severe than when you have initially a large volume of disease. How about the new lesions? One new lesion is probably less severe than having several new lesions. There might be certain localizations which are less lethal. So basically, if you want us to help you answer these questions, we're going to have to go back to basics. I think the, what we need to understand right now is what is your, and the patient's, of course, purpose in treating. Are we going for improved quantity of life? Are we trying to improve survival? Of course, that's the ideal thing. Uh, in that case, we're aiming for overall survival. We can't measure that directly with all these lines of treatment, so we'll have to use PFS. And if we're using PFS, we're going to have to decide where we put the threshold. Are we looking just for improved quality of life? In that case, you're going to be judging according to a combination of adverse events and cancer-related symptoms. So in a nutshell, how can I summarize what I've been saying? Well, concerning response, if you're asking the questions, how can radiologists tell you if it's working? Right now, I think the answer is it's working if it's not not working. And about progression, how can radiologists tell you if it's not working? I guess I can ask this question. Do you need radiologists to tell you if it's not working? I think you do, thank God. Um, I think what we're definitely looking at is um, patient profiles. I think that's really what we're going to have to start understanding. So I just summarized, I, I put the whole um, different types of patients on this schematic. You'll notice that here I changed the threshold because I really do think that this minus 10% is a good indication that the treatment is working. Um, over here for progression, I don't know yet. I don't know what the right answer is. I think that you're definitely going to be, um, you're going to have to wonder about how, um, how much you're, you want this therapy to work. If you're going to want to be aggressive, then you might want to keep the patients down here in the response. And as soon as they start going up, then you might want to change that therapy really fast. Whereas if you don't want to be so aggressive, then you might tolerate a slow progression. Of course, I think that one way to answer these questions is to understand what's going on. And the way to understand what's going on will be functional imaging. That's another one of our themes. Uh, we've been working a lot on tumor perfusion. This is a CT um, uh, parametric map on blood flow. And just to show an example of a patient, this is a, a metastatic lymph node. All the red pixels are the ones that are very vascular. So this is the baseline 
map, and you'll see that the, this lymph node is very red. After one cycle of treatment, you'll notice that there are no red pixels left, so he, um, the tumor has been totally devascularized. And as the tumor size decreased, suddenly we saw the vascularization reappear, and this preceded the increase in size. So I definitely think that functional imaging is the step that's going to teach us what's going on when patients start escaping treatment. And once we understand that, we might be able to answer the last question on progression. Thank you. <laughs>